In this video, we are going to learn how to make an asynchronous operation fire and forget. The idea of fire and forget means that we are going to fire the asynchronous operation and we are not going to wait for its resolution, but instead we are going to immediately return to the user. This basically means that we want to have that asynchronous operation running in the background. Although it doesn't have to be an asynchronous operation, in this video, we're going to make an example with an asynchronous operation. So let's see what we have here. We are in an SP.NET Core Web API application. This is a really simple application. It has an application DB context, which has two DB sets, which means that we have these two entities, person and lock. They are really simple entities because this is just a demo application. So the idea here is that we are in the people controller, we have this post endpoint in which we are adding a person and then after that we are adding a record in the logs table. So as you can see, we have two asynchronous operations. Let's say that we want that the second asynchronous operation to be a fire and forget operation. How can we do that? Well, our first choice could be to simply remove the await. If we simply remove the await, it means that we are executing this operation that we have here, but we are just not asynchronously awaiting it. Let's see what happens. Let me save, and let me say reveal and apply changes. Let's come here, and let's see that I can put a name here, Felipe, execute, and let's see that we have a 200 OK. And if we go to SQL Server Management Studio, we're going to see that in the people table we have Felipe, and in logs we have Felipe was inserted. OK, that is great. It means that our code is working, right? Yeah, but there are two things. The first one is this green squiggly line that we have. We can suppress it if we want to. Control dot here, suppress, and suppress CS 4014 and that gets rid of the green squiggly line. But that is not really what I want to say. The second thing that I was going to mention is that this has the problem of swallowing the exception. For example, let me provoke an exception. I will say log ID equal to one. Now, since ID is an identity property, it means that I cannot fill it with a custom value. So we're going to get an exception in this line, but if I do the following, if I say try, and I put everything inside of the try, and then I say catch exception x, and I say something like here, console right line, the catch, and let me do the same here, the try, I'll call it. We're going to see that we're never going to receive the catch, or we're never going to see the catch in the console. Let's see that. Let me press Control S and let's come here. Let's click on here, try it out. Let me say Claudia. Let me say execute. And we're going to see that if we come back to the console, we're going to see that although we have an exception here and we have the try here, we never really got the catch here. We never really got this message, the catch here, which means that indeed, this is swallowing the exception. So what can we do? Well, if you don't want to swallow the exception, what you should do is to use a task run. So let me say here, task run, and I will say here async lambda expression, and I will cut this and put it here. And we're going to see that here, since we are in an async context, I can use await. So I can use here await, but notice that I am awaiting this save changes async, but not this task here. And if you want to disappear these green squiggly lines, you can say discard equal to the task run. And then if I save, and this will recompile the application, and if we come back here, we're going to see that I can put another name here like Pedro, and let me say execute, and we're going to see that we have a 200 OK here, and here we have the try and the catch, which means that indeed we're not swallowing the exception this time. So this is better, this is an improvement, but we're still not quite there yet. 
You may think that this exception that we're getting here is because of this log ID equal to one that I have, but that is not the case. If I comment this out and let me put here console right line x message, you are going to see that the exception message is some other thing that you may not be expecting. Let's see that. Try it out. And let me put here Lorena and execute. We're going to see that we have a 200 OK, but in the error, what we have is cannot access a disposed context instance. What is that? Well, let's go to the basics. Let's remember that in the program class, we are configuring the application DB context using the add DB context, which means that we are registering in the dependency injection system our application DB context as a service, and by default, that is a scope service. And that service is then scoped to the HTTP context. And since I am first returning something before executing this line of code, then it means that the HTTP context has been discarded, has been disposed before we execute this line. And because the context has been disposed, because the HTTP context has been disposed, then we get this exception that we have here. So what can we do about it? Well, the solution is to create our own instance of the application DB context. Now we can use the iService provider for that. Let's come here and let's say iService provider, service provider control dot as a field. And then in here, I will say await using bar scope equal to service provider, create async scope. And then because I am creating an scope, I can use that scope to resolve our application DB context service. So let me say here, context equal to a scope service provider, get required service application DB context. And then we have that our application DB context is tied to this scope, which means that it is not tied to the HTTP context. And therefore this will leave even after we dispose the HTTP context. Let's see that. Let me prove that to you. Let's come here and let's say await task delay. I'll say five seconds. So I will wait five seconds before even writing this on the console. And after that, I will insert a log in the database. So let me save. And we're going to see that we are going to immediately receive a response from our web server. And then it is that we're going to insert the log. So let me have the console in here so that you can see everything. I will say execute and see that I got a response and I come back here and see that I don't even have to try. So after a few seconds, now I have the try and then I have the insert into logs. And if I go to SQL Server Management Studio, you are going to see that indeed we have Mario here which means that after a few seconds, we indeed inserted Mario into our logs table. So we first return to the user and then this operation finished executing and did what we wanted it to do. Now, if you don't like having all of this code here, there are several strategies which we can do. For example, the first one, which we will be examining in another video is using the library called Hangfire. But for this video, we will keep it simple. We will not add any new dependencies. And what I will do is that I will just create a service in which I am going to put this logic that we have here. So let me go here. Let me create a folder at folder repositories. And in repositories, I will add a new class. I'll call it logs repository. And in here, I will add an interface. I'll do it here just to save some time, but you can definitely put it in its own file if you want to. Now I will put this here because I want to implement this interface. Now what I will do is that first I will say public async task save log background. I say background because in here, what I'm going to use die service provider. So let me come here and let me cut all of this from here and I'll paste it here inside of this method. Now I need an instance of the service provider. So let me say here, ctor I service provider, service provider, control dot field. And this is good. Now let me say here, lock. Now let me say pull up, control dot pull up. 
which will allow me to put automatically the signature here in the interface. Now, what I want to do now is to substitute this for message because the message will come from the client class, which in our case is people controller. So I can delete this iService provider because I don't need it anymore here. Now, what I will do is that I will say I logs repository control dot logs repository control dot as a field. Let me delete this service provider from here and this service provider from here. And let me say here await logs repository save log and I will paste this message here. And let me put a semicolon here. Let me put this in another line so that you can visualize everything better. And now this code is a little bit more clean. It is cleaner. Now I need to register this service in the program class. So let's do that right away. Let me say here builder services at scoped. And I will say here I logs repository control dot to bring the namespace then logs repository. All right, we should be good to go. There shouldn't be any issues left. So I will keep this await here just so that you can see that everything works even if there is a delay. So let me save. This will recompile my application. Now let's come here and I will put the final name which can be Melissa, for example. And I will say execute and you will see that we have a 200. And if we go back to the console, you're going to see that we don't have the try. And now we have the try. And so as you can see, after a few seconds, we got back the message in the console. And now here in logs, we have Melissa has been inserted. Therefore, as you can see, we were able to implement a fire and forget functionality for our application. And also we learned that we need to use the service provider if we want to have our application DB context being used outside of the context of the HTTP context. Of course, as I mentioned before, we can use the third party library hang fire to not have to implement some of these things ourselves, but we will see that in another video. Thank you.